was a crime of greed, crime of emotion. He was gunned down in what police describe as an ambush as he collected the weekend receipts from this Awatuki movie theater. They let us know that they had not found the suspect as of yet. He could be in the area. And then I just knew, and I said, my son's dead, isn't he? She said he was. He chose that opportunity to basically execute him. It's a crime that shocked the community. Now we need to find him. This is True Crime Arizona, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. It was just after Thanksgiving in 2004. Kids in Phoenix were in class on their first day back since Turkey Day, getting in the holiday spirit with Christmas right around the corner. That Monday was shaping up to be a pretty good day for the Ahwatukee community, a nice suburb in the southern part of Phoenix. That all took a turn when out of nowhere, neighborhoods were under siege. What we do know is that this is a very dangerous, violent individual. As you know, uh, our victim uh, was basically ambushed and in a cold-blooded manner executed. SWAT team members with tactical gear and rifles were swarming Awatuki streets, stopping cars coming in and out of the area. Schools were locking their doors and gates, fearful of who was out there. My biggest concern right now is for the kids and making sure that they feel safe and secure. At the time, residents didn't know many details other than this. There was a killer on the loose and that was enough to know safety for everyone was at risk. The FBI immediately jumped on the case. He absolutely could be dangerous. This was a crime of greed, a crime of emotion. If he's capable of doing it once, he's likely capable of doing it again. The thing is, this killer was never caught. He's still out there. It's been 18 years. So why was he recently taken off the FBI's top 10 most wanted list? It was a quiet Monday at the AMC movie theater, off Ray Road in Phoenix. After the busy weekend of families eating their Thanksgiving leftovers and heading to the movies, employees expected a slower day. Like usual, at the time in 2004, the Dunbar armored car employees would stop by to pick up the weekend receipts. 24-year-old Keith Palomares was the guard who headed in to pick up the cash. Employee Gary Lawson, who sold and collected tickets inside, was used to seeing Keith and said he was always so friendly. But on November 29th, as Keith Palomares walked out of the theater and was heading back to the armored car, gunshots rang out. He was gunned down in what police describe as an ambush as he collected the weekend receipts from this Awatuki movie theater. Witnesses frantically called 911. Keith was unresponsive on the ground. This is definitely planned because he walked right up to him and he shot him five times. Gary Lawson was stunned. He had just seen Keith. It's extremely scary, yeah, that anyone can just come up and shoot somebody. The shooter didn't just kill Keith. He took the money the young guard collected for his job and fled. Immediately, the FBI was tasked with trying to not only find the suspect who was armed and dangerous and figure out his motive and background, but other agents were tasked with something else. Notifying Keith's mother, Lena Rodriguez, who lived in Las Vegas at the time. It's that call every parent fears more than anything. And then I just knew, and I said, my son's dead, isn't he? She said he was. <laughs> Lena channeled her grief into telling the media about her son, who she said wanted to become a police officer, especially part of the SWAT team. He had also just gotten married the year before to his wife, Desiree. He was kind-hearted. He loved people. He was very giving of himself, very, he was never selfish. He, he would never leave the house without telling me he loved me or kissed me by, even if he was upset with me. Because he always believed 
tomorrow may never come. That had become a heartbreaking reality. Authorities were desperate to find Keith's killer and bring this family swift justice. This was an all-out manhunt by the FBI and Phoenix police. They let us know that they had not found the suspect as of yet. He could be in the area, so we decided for the safety of the kids it would be best to lock down. Schools were on lockdown. Residents were told to stay inside. We locked all the doors and brought our sons back inside and would let them play outside. Kind of interrupted our day, but got to be safe. Lead FBI agent on the case, Lance Lysing, had to figure out one thing quick. Who was this man? They figured out a name. Jason Derrick Brown. Well, the evidence indicates that he conducted surveillance. He was aiming to rob an armored car specifically because he thought the take on an armored car would be significant. Uh, he was wrong on a lot of those counts, Jason was. So he targeted Keith simply because he was an armored car driver in the role he had. Keith was an innocent victim, no tie at all to Brown. Jason Brown wasn't even from here. He is not local. He is from the Southern California area around Los Angeles. We do not know uh, if he's still in the Phoenix area. Uh, it's possible that he has left the area and gone back to California. We don't know that for sure. Authorities learn Brown was in debt. He had taken a firearms course recently and had escaped by bicycle, which they found dumped in bushes nearby. The bicycle was a key piece of evidence. From there, investigators found that he had been staying in a hotel in the Awatuki area right off the freeway. And from there, it just kind of snowballed. The hotel lobby surveillance cameras showed him inside. Brown fled with $56,000. We found witnesses that said that he had been casing this uh, place before this incident happened. So it's pretty obvious from the way he approached the victim that he knew what the victim was doing there. And he chose that opportunity to basically execute him. It's a crime that shocked the community. And uh, we are very, very glad that we have named him. Now we need to find him. Once he was named a suspect, Keith's mother showed grace in how she reacted to the situation knowing the FBI and Phoenix police were doing everything they could to find Jason Derrick Brown. I, I want to hate him, but I don't want to live in hate. Lance Lysing is now retired, but this case took up more than a decade of his life before he left the FBI in 2020, after a lengthy career as an agent heading up some of the most brazen crime cases. This was a case that the FBI put a lot of time into and still does to this day, Phoenix Police Department as well. Lance said they believed Jason Brown got back to California and had a lead on his whereabouts. But then... Slipping out of our fingers just barely in Southern California. Gone again. This was not a career criminal, so the thought of Brown able to evade authorities over and over again didn't seem likely. But after three years went by with no hits on his location, he was added to the FBI's top 10 most wanted fugitives list and became the center of TV shows, documentaries, and America's Most Wanted. So the FBI's top 10 list is excellent for a variety of reasons. It is a tool that investigators use, and it's a great tool because it brings notoriety, and notoriety brings tips. They're like gold in a fugitive case. You can get millions of eyes looking for your fugitive when he's on the top 10 list, as opposed to when he's not. Immediately, calls were pouring into the FBI at record pace. It's well over 10,000 tips. I know it, at one point, it might have rivaled the most tips that any fugitive had received on the FBI's top 10 list. Why was Jason Derrick Brown generating so many more tips than other fugitives on the list? I mean, there were drug cartel leaders and other killers on there too. But the thing about Brown was, there was nothing unique. The fugitive's very common name, Jason Brown, his very common look. He had a California surfer kind of look. And when you're looking in SoCal, that could be anybody. So in my time in investigating the case, which ended in around 2020, there was not one single corroborated sighting out of the tens of thousands of tips we received. In late 2022, Jason Derrick Brown was taken off the FBI's top 10 most wanted fugitives list, despite never being found. And the comments on social media started pouring in. How do you remove one of the most dangerous men in the United States from that list when he's still out there? Lance says there are a couple reasons. It just wasn't working. 
if you're an FBI agent and you're deciding who is on that top 10 list, you have a lot of other fugitives in line and a lot of other fugitives where the FBI top 10 list may serve its purpose and drive that arrest now, immediately. And there are a lot of bad individuals that need to be on that list. Is there a possibility Jason Brown is still dangerous? Lance says, absolutely. Have we seen that or have we found evidence that he's done that again? No, in, in these 18 years. So that threat de-escalates somewhat. And there are many other individuals that are more immediate, imminent threat to the community than Jason might be at this point. This doesn't mean the case isn't still being investigated. Though Lance says this may change the priority of how tips are investigated. Every FBI agent wants to catch a top 10 fugitive. So when your fugitive's on the top 10 list and you have a good hot lead in another office in another country even, and you call up your FBI co-workers in those areas and you tell them, hey, I've got a tip on a top 10 fugitive, they usually work it really fast. All FBI agents are busy. They've got loads and loads of tips and they're tr trying to prioritize the immediacy of all of those. The top 10 fugitive goes to the top of that list. So that's about the only change that would matter. The warrants are still active. He still has a warrant out of Maricopa County for the homicide. He still has a federal warrant for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. Those warrants remain in effect. Arizona has some notable crimes and Jason Derrick Brown was not the only Arizona criminal to be taken off that notorious list this year. In January of 2022, another infamous suspected killer, Robert Fisher. If you're an avid listener of this podcast, then you definitely know who Robert Fisher is. The focus of our latest true crime Arizona documentary and an entire season on this podcast He's the most well-known fugitive to come out of Arizona. Fisher is believed to have killed his wife, Mary, and two young kids, Brittany and Bobby, in their Scottsdale home in April of 2001. He rigged a gas line that caused their house to explode. Their throats were slit so deep, they were nearly decapitated. His forerunner was found 10 days later in the Northeast Arizona woods, where he would often camp and hunt and his dog was found alive with the car, but Robert Fisher was never seen again. For the same reasons Jason Brown was taken off the list, same goes for Robert Fisher. His case has garnered so much media attention over the years from around the world with no confirmation he's ever been seen again. Lance says it's easy for people to think Jason Brown and Robert Fisher have some similarities, and that's why these two cases specifically keep people hooked even decades later. The mystery part plays a role in both these cases for sure, because you have Fisher who is a billed as a, a mountain man and a wilderness survivalist. He may or may not have been that, but he was billed that way. So the mystery of him being in the mountains is there. And then you have Jason Brown that was just the master of taking over other identities, born with a silver spoon in his mouth, was kind of the Jekyll and Hyde fugitive. So there was a mystery there as well. And, and some theories about where he could have gone that were a little far-fetched. You know, both of those Grab, grab your interest. But Lance says these are actually two very different kinds of killers. There are two different types of crimes. One is a very emotional, very connected crime where Robert Fisher killed his family, his wife and his two kids. I mean, that is a crime of passion that takes rage. Jason Brown's crime was a crime of greed. I mean, he wanted the money. He didn't care who he hurt to get that money. Two different motives. They both resulted in deaths of innocent people that didn't deserve that. Jason, it was more, I think, who the fugitive was. Um, and then it was so unlike an individual to go straight to homicide without much of a criminal history at all. And just for a little bit of money. I mean, money that was long, long gone. So, so yeah, they got notoriety for two different reasons, I would say, but both of them are notorious. Lance doesn't like to give theories on what he believes happened to these long lost fugitives, but he did give a glimpse into what he believes was the fate of Jason Derrick Brown. If he was alive, I believe we would have found him, but there's no direct evidence of that or proof of that. That's why the warrants will stay active, the case will stay open, and they're gonna to continue to look for him. The notoriety of a case like this can sometimes be what people remember most, but families and friends of the victims in these cases have had to deal with these losses and no answers for far too long. Keith Palomares was shot five times in the head. At the time, his best friend, Craig Hubble, 
could hardly bear the pain. The day before is the last day I saw him. And if I were to do that, I would have said something else to him. Or just tell me to be careful. He was the type of guy that you want as a friend. And I always want around you. Because he was removed from the top 10 most wanted list, now more than ever, the FBI and Phoenix police need people to come forward with tips, anything that can lead to closure in this case. It's all a once grieving mother deserves. My son is never, there's never been anybody like my son. My son, he was just a beautiful person. I love my son so much. <laughs> he didn't deserve to die this way. He didn't. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Jason Derrick Brown, please call the Phoenix FBI or Phoenix Police Department. True Crime Arizona, the podcast, is hosted by me, Brianna Whitney, and produced by Sergio Hernandez. It's a production of Arizona's Family, 3TV, CBS5, and azfamily.com in Phoenix, Arizona. This is True Crime Arizona, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. 